Thank you, Celia. Thank you, Divine Groove, for the little impromptu thing there. <laughs> so, I'm sure you've noticed a beautiful, bouncy, big-hearted, boisterous, blissful, busy practitioner and ministerial student around here. I need you to also know that when she teaches Science of Mind principles, she is absolutely very, very smart. <laughs> she is a musician, a teacher, an artist, a writer, and today she is a guest speaker at New Vision Center. Please help me welcome our very own Leslie Goodwin. Thank you, everybody. I'm sure you can imagine, you know, the, the tears kind of well, the emotion comes up. Such a joy it is to stand here as a first-time ministerial speaker here at home with, with my peeps. So thank you for having me. It means a lot. So we're in the month of abundance. And when I was told that we were going to be speaking about abundance, the first thing that came up for me is this um, definition that's been kind of bubbling around the community at large. I think the first time I encountered it was from um, Karen Lewis, my fellow ministerial student, and it's abundance as overflowing good. So yes, abundance definitely has to do with, with cash money, with finances, and I love money, and I, you're never going to catch me denigrating having money. In fact, I will be accepting any money that you would like to give me after this talk. Gladly. <laughs> but what it also is, that overflowing good, it's an overflowing good of relationships, of family, of beauty and grace, of love and wholeness, of all things good, of that creative energy that brings us through this thing that we love and helps us to express it out into the world. So when we're talking abundance through this whole talk, we're talking an overflow of good in every way, in every level, everything you ever could want, things you haven't even thought of wanting yet. Don't worry, we'll get to that part. We'll, we'll fill you up with some more stuff you want. So for me, when I really think about when, when did I anchor into abundance and how did I become clear about how I felt about it, it takes me back to this place when I first started studying science of mind. And like many people, like many people in our movement, I was going through a very difficult time in my life when I first started anchoring into these principles. I was going through a divorce. I had two small children. I was really not at all sure how I was going to make all of those pieces come together into a life that worked for me. And because of one of the joys of my personality, which involves all those B words, the bouncy, bubbly, all that stuff, I didn't ask anybody for help at all. I was just in my little head, forging ahead um, very stubbornly. So after coming here quite a few times and realizing, okay, I'm going to lose my mind if I don't shift how I'm approaching this topic, I decided that it would be a really good day to, to have a talk with the divine. And this is a June day. We're having an unseasonably early monsoon. So you can join me in the mental picture. And I'm in the backyard. It's one of those days where it's sunny and raining at the same time. I'm in the backyard sitting in the grass saying, okay, God, put up or shut up. What the hell? What's going on? I needed to get straight. Do I believe what I say I believe? Do I really believe that? Do I really believe that spirits got me? Do I really believe that it's infinitely abundant and infinitely supplying and that I am good no matter what? Because if so, golden, I can go in and, you know, maybe tell off. But if not, I can sleep in on Sundays. Because what am I doing here, right? <laughs> People do that. People just sleep in. But no, it became clear to me as I had this conversation with the divine in my yard, in the rain, I had either lost my mind, like full-on psychotic break, or I was having a mystical experience. And I tend to lean towards believing it was a mystical experience because that, that fuels my needs. So, <laughs> so it became very clear to me that what I needed to do, if, if I have really anchored into this teaching of science of mind, and this is truly what I believe, I need to go into the writings of Ernest Holmes and see what he had to say 
about abundance, about prosperity, about trusting the universe. And he had this beautiful quote. It's uh, page 50 in the Science of Mind text. Here and now we are surrounded by and immersed in an infinite good. How much of this infinite good is ours? All of it. How much of it can we have to use? As much of it as we can embody. And I thought, yeah, I can be down with that as much of it as I can body. I am a very embodying person. I can have a lot, right? So because part of the way I personally embody things is I slowly make them shorter and shorter and simpler and shorter and make what I call Leslie's lazy paraphrase. And then later I will insist that that's actually what Ernest Holmes said. Never, never directly quote me because I totally make things up. But I always have the right idea. Ernest Holmes did that, by the way. Um, if you go to some of his later writings that are directly dictated, there are some misattributions, some kind of sketchy quotes, but the idea is always there. So I'm in, good, I'm in good hands. But my paraphrase became, how much good can I have as much as I can embody? It's got the basics of the quote there, right? And it became something that I could anchor into. How much good can I have as much as I can embody? How much good can I have as much as I can embody? And I started to feel better. I started to feel better. But what I did not feel was abundance blossoming. I felt calm. I felt peace. I felt good. But I did not feel abundance blossoming in my life. And then I had it lovingly pointed out to me by my practitioner at the time, Suzanne Musa, who was wonderful. She said, tell me what your affirmation is. You ready? Be ready to laugh at me. Okay. My affirmation was, and this was progress. I just want to be okay. I just want to be okay. And in the moment that I made that affirmation in the rain with God and the crazy and the breakdown or not breakdown, I just want to be okay was a huge step forward. I just want to know that the universe has got me. I just want to be okay. But as we do better, but I'm still at just okay. As I continue to affirm, I just want to be okay, all I got was okay. And that became not okay. That became not okay. So what I really needed to do was to dig deeper into this quote. This quote contains, this not quote, this made, the made up paraphrase quote that isn't the quote, contains everything we need for an abundant successful life. If we break it down and actually pay attention to what it says. So that's what we're going to do in this talk. Y'all with me? That's the first y'all, if anybody's, if there's a drinking game going on in the back. <laughs> so there's a lot in this quote. The first thing we need to know, if we're really going to anchor into this quote, is how much good is there? You know, if I'm wondering how much I can have, how much is there? Astrophysics tells us that we live in an infinite universe, and it is infinitely expanding. Now, the mystics have been telling us this forever, right? As far back as you go in mystic writing, you're going to find exactly the same thing. But now science can prove it, and so, ha, oh, it's big news now. We live in an infinite universe, and it's infinitely expanding. Now, if we go into those same sacred texts, every single one of them, you cannot find a religion, a faith, a wisdom, or philosophy that will tell you anything other than this. The divine essence of the universe wants us to have that good. It wants us to have it. If you go to the Bible, it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. There isn't a religion you can find that doesn't say that. Ernest Holmes would say the entire universe is conspiring for your good. It wants us to have it because how it expands in this great expansion, how it expands is it expands through us. Everything we do, everything we think, everything we say is expressing that divine energy into the world. That's how it grows. It wants us to have it. Michelle Madrano, y'all might know her. She's, she's a friend of mine. I like her. Reverend Dr. Michelle Madrano, to be appropriately respectful, is fond of saying, of playing this game, of teaching people this game, and, and y'all might have played it before. If you can see it, you can have it. If I can see it, I can have it. Right? Think about that. If I can see it, I can have it. If it has entered into my consciousness enough that it's in alignment with who and what I am, I will see it. I might not have it yet, but I'll see it. Something else might walk by and I might not even see it at all. My friend Karen likes to talk about a red convertible. 
I want the red convertible, I want the red convertible. If you're really focused on a red convertible, you might see every red car on the freeway. Turns out there are lots of them if you're shopping for a red convertible. You might see every convertible on a freeway. You might not see the blue minis. They're there. They don't disappear because you're shopping for red convertible, but it's not in your consciousness. It's not aligned with your energy. You don't see it. If you can see it, you can have it. We're going to come back to that. Let that seep. People have a hard time um, letting that be so until they realize, dude, it's totally so. So the final part of this quote we need to dig into if we're really going to learn how to live abundant lives is embodiment. We love to talk about embodiment in New Thought. We love to talk about it. What we don't really like to do is tell you what it means or how to do it. We just, we just talk about it and assume you know. So embodiment, it's different than knowing. It's different than understanding. It's not an academic experience. Y'all following me? If you are anything like me, and I'm sure that you have all gone much past this phase, if you're anything like me, you have some books, somewhere between 100 and all of the books. I have all, I have all the books. And you have them organized in your wonderful shelves, and, and if you're really good, you've actually read the books, and not just bought them. But we love, we love to read our books. And I've got my shelves. I've got my shelves of pagan books, my shelves of Buddhist books, my shelves of Ernest Holmes books, and my shelves of Marianne Williamson books, and, and er, Eckhart Tolle. And I, have all, I have all the books. And it never occurs to me to get rid of any of the books because I, I need the books. I have been studying science of mind principle. Or I'm going to back that up. I've been studying metaphysics since I was 14. I have read all the books. And they keep writing new ones. And have you all noticed? They say the same thing. They all <laughs> say the same thing. It's really good. You should totally read them. And they say the same thing. And knowing isn't going to get you there. Understanding isn't going to get you there. Up here. Mary Man and Morrissey says, stop telling me that you know. Because who's sat in the class and heard the same thing for the 79th time and thought, oh, I know that. I know. I know that. But if it's not showing up in your life, you don't know. You know it, but you don't know it. And this is what's going to get you there. This is what embodiment is. So now we're going to talk about how to embody. Are you with me? Are we going? All right. In order to really embody our good, we have to change our mind. We're good at that. Super good in this movement. And then we have to change our spiritual practice. And finally, we have to change our worldly action because that's how we know when it's truly, really embodied. So first, we're going to change our mind. Dr. Dean, who is the, he's, first I have to tell you, he's the over dean of all of the schools of ministry, and his name is Dr. Dean. <laughs> so we call him Dean Dean. <laughs> and he doesn't really like it, but we all do it anyway because it's funny. <laughs> So Dean Dean pointed out to us at the, the recent ministerial student conference that um, Jeff and I were at, he pointed out to us that absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. It's a classic logic fallacy to think that because I can't see something, that's proof that it's not there. Not so. Not so. Absence of evidence of your abundant nature, your personal, I'm talking to you, your personal abundant nature is not evidence of the absence of that nature. It's simply not. What it is evidence of is an absence of a strong mental equivalent. So mental equivalent is a science of mind lingo term. It's kind of a weird word, and everybody doesn't quite understand what it means unless someone's up here explaining it right this very moment. All it is is an image of the very best that you think is possible for you in your life on a given topic, on a given area of your life. So I invite you to bring up into your consciousness the idea of some area of your life that you would like to see be bigger, better, more expansive, more awesome. Just let it float up. That that you see right now is your mental equivalent right now. And what's my evidence of that? That's what's out picturing in your life, right? Your mental equivalent is always that which is out picturing in your life. So if you wish to have a different out picture, you got to have a different mental equivalent. How do we do that though, right? It's easier than you think. If you invite 
everybody to either close their eyes or just take a soft gaze, gazing down. And allow to rise up to your consciousness the image of someone you know who is doing well in the area you'd like to improve. Someone who has what you would like to have or their version of it. Feel into it. Be in that space. Give me a nod if you're able to do that. Awesome. If you can see it, you can have it. And you are seeing it right now. So your mental equivalent has just shifted. You've just proven that you can have what you're imagining. Because that's the way the law works. If you can see it, you can have it. So let's get crazy. Let's get really crazy. Let that image drop away. And this time, bring up an image of the most opulent, crazy, over-the-top, extreme version of that area you'd like to improve. It can be fiction. It can be a cartoon character. If you've got Scrooge McDuck diving into a room full of coins right now, you are doing this right. Donald Trump building a 79 millionth building and still saying, I make so much money. <laughs> what, <laughs> whatever your version is, let that come up. Feel into it. This is your new mental equivalent. If you can see it, you can have it. If you can pull this up in your mind, you can have it. This is how we change our mind. This is how we change our mind. So go ahead and come back to the room with me. Keep that feeling tone, but come back to the room with me. This is what we are so good at in science of mind, right? This is what our books tell us. This is what our classes teach us. We're so good at it. But as my friend G.I. Joe would tell me, now I know, and knowing is half the battle. Kind of just let y'all know how old I am. <laughs> Knowing is half the battle, but it's only half the battle. Everything beyond that is embodiment. Deepening physically, spiritually into that knowingness, right? So the next step of that is to change our spiritual actions. If you have taken a class with me or if you've been in one of my study groups, I apologize because you have heard this, you tell this tale before, and you will hear me tell it again and again and again forever, because I think that this is the truth of the message I have to give here and always. I studied, like I said, I studied metaphysics from the time I was 14. I knew everything there was to know as far as what books could tell you. I'm a good studier. But when did my life change? When did it really change? when I started daily spiritual practice. I know that this is not a new message for y'all. Daily spiritual practice. I took a class called Spiritual Practices right here at New Vision Center, and I was encouraged to do a daily spiritual mind treatment and to meditate for, I am not making this up, 10 minutes a day. 10 minutes. One spiritual mind treatment, which is our form of affirmative prayer, any prayer will do, 10 minutes of meditation. And I did it every single day for the eight weeks that that class lasted. And everything changed. Now, do I think spiritual mind treatment changed my life? No. No. I like it. I think it's really cool. Y'all should do it a lot. But no, I do not think spiritual mind treatment changed my life. I think that taking a chunk of my day, a tiny chunk, 12, 13 minutes of my day, every day, and anchoring into the reality that living a spiritual life is the most important thing for me to do, to live a happy, healthy, prosperous life. That it is not something that I fit in around the other things that I do. That it's not something that I have time for or I don't. That I do it every day. Start every day and end every day, no exceptions, no matter what, with the idea that I live in an infinite universe and that I am the way that this one expresses. As are all of you. 13 minutes a day changed everything. And there is no point where you stop needing that. In fact, when you start taking classes to become a practitioner, they encourage you to double your spiritual practice. And when you finish your training and you become a licensed practitioner, they encourage you to double your spiritual practice. And when you sign up for ministerial school, they encourage you to double your spiritual practice. And I'm willing to bet that when I receive my ministerial license, they're going to strongly encourage me to double my spiritual practice, 
to live my whole life, because that's what being a minister is, right? To live my whole life based in principle, based in this oneness and this unity. If you take one thought from this room today, it is this. 12 minutes, 13 minutes. There's no way you don't have time. There's no way. I'm not buying it. I'm calling BS on y'all. So once this happens, once we have anchored into our daily spiritual practice, and it has really shifted, we will know, we will know that we can go tell Reverend Mary Mann and Morrissey that we know when our worldly actions shift. So at the same ministerial student convention, there was a lot of good stuff at that convention. Um, Dr. I'm, I'm gesturing at Jeff because it's Dr. Kim Kaiser who is the dean of the Santa Rosa campus, which Jeff attends. Dr. Kim Kaiser brought to my attention this um, paraphrase. It's, it's a Dr. Kim Kaiser's lazy paraphrase instead of a Leslie's lazy paraphrase, but I totally stole it. From the Reverend Dr. Michael Bernard Beckwith, who is wonderful. Um, what Dr. Beckwith tells us is, I never want to see you spend another dime in your life. We're talking about abundance, right? Never spend another dime in your life. Circulate your money. Why does he say this? Because spending implies loss. It's gone. It's away. I can't have it anymore. It's gone. We don't spend our money. We circulate it. And how we do that is we take into account when we're writing that check to the cable company. Does anybody still have cable? <laughs> when, when writing that check to Netflix. Does anybody still write checks? <laughs> when we're sending money, <laughs> when we're sending money out, what we don't think about is, oh, I don't want to have to pay this bill. They keep raising the rates. No. What we think about is everybody who works at the phone store, who gets to have a job because we pay our phone bill how they take that money home to their family and get to buy food and have a lovely dinner and pay that child soccer fees so that her coach can pay for meals for his family so that daughter can go to soccer camp so the other daughter can go to space camp and fund NASA and more kids can learn about space and astrophysics so that they can continue to study and talk to us about our infinitely expanding universe, how it continues to grow so they can continue to feed us what we need to know to know the truth about our own lives. The cycle never stops. Nothing is ever gone. We circulate our money. And every time we do that with love, with appreciation, with valuing of our own participatory energy, in the circulation of goods, of love, of energy, of caring, that drop of love goes every step along the way. This is how we change our universe. You've heard that phrase, we're the ones we're waiting for? Be the change you wish to see? This is how we do it. We know the truth. We know the truth. We embody the truth, and then we live it in such a way that everybody is impacted by it. This is abundant living. This is the truth of who we are. So let's take that into prayer. And so we just breathe deeply into this one truth, the very breath of life, anchoring ever more deeply with every breath the knowingness that sweet spirit is here, in us, as us, through us, every moment, all the time. And that as we do live in an infinite universe that is infinitely expanding, we know that that expansion is in and through each one of us. As the love in our life, the joy in our life, the calm and the peace, the harmony and the grace, the givingness of life continues to operate in us, through us, as us. The very spirit of God is breathing each of us right here and right now. Whether we're in this room or just listening to this voice, or watching online. Truth is active for each one of us. The universe is conspiring for our good in the area of our life we would like to see expanded. We recognize that abundance right now. 
We lean into this expanded mental equivalent knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt that every step of every way is supported, guided, and uplifted by this intelligence, by this love, by this grace that we celebrate here today. I know that the truth of this blesses each and every one of us, that it blesses this center, New Vision Center, all the good that it does, all the beauty that it brings. And that as we give our tithes and offerings to this center, we continue that spirit of circulation, recognizing, understanding, seeing that the good that we give continues on, blessing the staff, blessing the congregants, blessing the people who attend classes and following those people off to their places of work, following those places off to their homes, knowing that the love that we give here, the intelligence and wisdom, the philosophical truth that we anchor into here is valuable and important and meaningful, and that our participation in the circulation of it is part of the embodiment of our own good. And so too I say a blessing to every person out there of every faith tradition and philosophy who is seeking their good, knowing that all paths lead to the one. All paths lead to the one. So we bless them, we claim them, we honor them. And we honor ourselves knowing that we will take those blessed 12 minutes because we are worth it. And I invite you to join me in anchoring this truth by saying, and so it is.